Section 20. Part 1 of Chapter 3 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blexton. Book 1. Chapter 3. Part 1. CHAPTER THE THIRD OF THE KING AND HIS TITLE The supreme executive power of these kingdoms is vested by our laws in a single person, the king or queen. For it matters not to which sex the crown descends, but the person entitled to it, whether male or female, is immediately invested with all the ensigns, rights, and prerogative of sovereign power and is declared by Statute 1, Mary, Statute 3, Chapter 1. In discoursing the royal rights and authority, I shall consider the king under six distinct views. 1. With regard to his title. 2. His royal family. 3. His councils. 4. His duties. 5. His prerogative. 6. His revenue and first, with regard to his title. The executive power of the English nation, being vested in a single person, by general consent of the people, the evidence of which general consent is long and immemorial usage, it became necessary to the freedom and peace of the state that a rule should be laid down, uniform, universal, and permanent, in order to mark out with precision who is that single person, to whom are committed, in subversion to the law of the land, the care and protection of the community, and to whom, in return, the duty and allegiance of every individual are due. It is of the highest importance to the public tranquillity, and to the consciences of private men, that this rule should be clear and indisputable and our constitution has not left us in the dark upon this material occasion. It will therefore be the endeavour of this chapter to trace out the constitutional doctrine of the royal succession, with that freedom and regard to truth, yet mixed with that reverence and respect, which the principles of liberty and the dignity of the subject require. The grand fundamental maxim upon which the jus coronae, or rights of succession to the throne of these kingdoms, depends, I take this to be, that the crown is, by common law and constitutional custom, hereditary, and this in a manner peculiar to itself, but that the rights of inheritance may, from time to time, be changed or limited by act of Parliament, under which limitations the crown still continues hereditary. And this proposition it will be the business of this chapter to prove, in all its branches. First, that the crown is hereditary. Secondly, that it is hereditary in a manner peculiar to itself. Thirdly, that this inheritance is subject to limitation by Parliament. Lastly, that when it is so limited, it is hereditary in the new proprietor. 1. First, it is in general hereditary, or descendable to the next heir, on the death or demise of the last proprietor. All regal governments must be either hereditary or elective, and, as I believe, there is no instance wherein the crown of England has ever been asserted to be elective, except by the regicides at the infamous and unparalleled trial of King Charles I, it must of consequence be hereditary. Yet, while I assert an hereditary, I by no means intend a jure divino title to the throne. Such a title may be allowed to have subsisted under the theocratic establishment of the children of Israel in Palestine, but it never yet subsisted in any other country, save only so far as kingdoms, like other human fabrics, are subject to the general and ordinary dispensations of providence. 
nor indeed have a jure divino and an hereditary right any necessary connection with each other, as some have very weakly imagined. The titles of David and Jehu were equally jure divino, as those of either Solomon or Ahab, and yet David slew the sons of his predecessor, and Jehu his predecessor himself. And when our kings have the same warrant as they had, whether it be to sit upon the throne of their fathers, or to destroy the house of the preceding sovereign, they will then, and not before, possess the crown of England by a right like theirs, immediately derived from heaven. The hereditary right, which the laws of England acknowledge, owes its origin to the founders of our constitution, and to them only. It has no relation to, nor depends upon, the civil laws of the Jews, the Greeks, the Romans, or any other nation upon earth. The municipal laws of our society having no connection with, or influence upon, the fundamental polity of another. The founders of our English monarchy might perhaps, if they had thought proper, have made it an elective monarchy, but they rather chose, and upon good reason, to establish originally a succession by inheritance. This has been acquiesced in by general consent, and ripens by degrees into common law. The very same title that every private man has to his own estate. Lands are not naturally descendable any more than thrones, but the law has thought proper, for the benefit and peace of the public, to establish hereditary succession in one as well as the other. It must be owned, an elective monarchy seems to be the most obvious, and best suited of any, to the rational principles of government, and the freedom of human nature, and accordingly we find it from history that, in the infancy and first rudiments of almost every state, the leader, chief magistrate, or prince, has usually been elective, and if the individuals who compose that state could always continue true to first principles, uninfluenced by passion or prejudice, unassailed by corruption, and unawed by violence, elective succession were as much to be desired in a kingdom as in other inferior communities. The best, the wisest, and the bravest man would then be sure of receiving that crown, which his endowments have merited, and the sense of an unbiased majority would be dutifully acquiesced in by the few who were of different opinions. But history and observation will inform us that elections of every kind, in the present state of human nature, are too frequently brought about by influence, partiality, and artifice. And even where the case is otherwise, these practices will be often suspected, and as constantly charged upon the successful, by a splenetic, disappointed minority. This is an evil, to which all societies are liable, as well those of a private and domestic kind, as the great community of the public, which regulates and includes the rest. But in the former there is this advantage, that such suspicions, if false, proceed no further than jealousies and murmurs, which time will effectually suppress, and if true, the injustice may be remedied by legal means, by an appeal to those tribunals to which every member of society has, by becoming such, virtually engaged to submit. Whereas, in the great and independent society, which every nation composes, there is no superior to resort to, but the law of nature, no method to redress the infringements of that law, but the actual exertion of private force. As therefore, between two nations, complaining of mutual injuries, the quarrel can only be decided by the law of arms. So, in one and the same nation, 
when the fundamental principles of their common union are supposed to be invaded, and more especially when the appointment of their chief magistrate is alleged to be unduly made, the only tribunal to which the complaints can appeal is that of the god of battles. The only process by which the appeal can be carried on is that of a civil and intestine war. An hereditary succession to the crown is therefore now established, in this and most other countries, in order to prevent that periodical bloodshed and misery, which the history of ancient imperial Rome and the more modern experience of Poland and Germany may show us are the consequences of elective kingdoms. 2. But, secondly, as to the particular mode of inheritance, it in general corresponds with the feudal path of descent, chalked out by the common law in the succession to landed estates, yet with one or two material exceptions. Like them, the crown will descend linearly to the issue of the reigning monarch, as it did from King John to Richard II, through a regular pedigree of six lineal descents, as in them the preference of males to females and the right of primogeniture among the males are strictly adhered to. Thus Edward V succeeded to the crown, in preference to Richard his younger brother and Elizabeth his elder sister. Like them, on failure of the male line, it descends to the issue female, according to the ancient British custom remarked by Tacitus. Solent feminarum ductu bellare, et sexum in imperis non discernere. Thus, Mary I succeeded to Edward VI, and the line of Margaret, Queen of Scots, the daughter of Henry the Seventh, succeeded on failure of the line of Henry the Eighth, his son. But, among the females, the crown descends by right of primogeniture to the eldest daughter only, and her issue, and not, as in common inheritances, to all the daughters at once. The evident necessity of a sole succession to the throne, having occasioned the royal law of descent to depart from the common law in this respect, and therefore Queen Mary, on the death of her brother, succeeded to the crown alone, and not in partnership with her sister Elizabeth. Again, the doctrine of representation prevails in the descent of the crown, as it does in other inheritances, whereby the lineal descendants of any person deceased stand in the same place as their ancestor, if living, would have done. Thus, Richard II succeeded his grandfather Edward III, in right of his father the Black Prince, to the exclusion of all his uncles, his grandfather's younger children. Lastly, on failure of lineal descendants, the crown goes to the next collateral relations of the late king, provided they are lineally descended from the blood royal, that is, from that royal stock which originally acquired the crown. Thus, Henry I succeeded to William II, John to Richard I, and James I to Elizabeth, being all derived from the conqueror, who was then the only regal stock. But herein there is no objection, as in the case of common descent, to the succession of a brother, an uncle, or other collateral relation, of the half-blood, that is, where the relationship proceeds not from the same couple of ancestors, which constitutes a kinsman of the whole blood, but from a single ancestor only, as when two persons are derived from the same father, and not from the same mother, or vice versa, provided only that the one ancestor from whom both are descended be he from whose veins the blood royal is communicated to each. Thus, Mary I inherited to Edward VI, and Elizabeth inherited to Mary, 
all born of the same father, King Henry the Eighth, but all by different mothers, the reason of which diversity, between royal and common descents, will be better understood hereafter, when we examine the nature of inheritances in general. 3. The doctrine of hereditary right does not by means imply an indefeasible right to the throne. No man will, I think, assert this, that has considered our laws, constitution, and history, without prejudice, and with any degree of attention. It is unquestionably in the breast of the supreme legislative authority of this kingdom, the king and both houses of parliament, to defeat this hereditary right, and by particular entails, limitations, and provisions, to exclude the immediate heir, and vest the inheritance in any one else. This is strictly consonant to our laws and constitution, as may be gathered from the expression so frequently used in our statute book, of, quote, the king's majesty, his heirs and successors, end quote, in which we may observe that, as the word heirs necessarily implies an inheritance or hereditary right, generally subsisting in the royal person, so the word successors, distinctly taken, must imply that this inheritance may sometimes be broke through, or that there may be a successor, without being the heir, of the king. And this is so extremely reasonable, that without such a power, lodged somewhere, our policy would be very defective. For let us barely suppose so melancholy a case, as that the heir apparent should be a lunatic, an idiot, or otherwise incapable of reigning. How miserable would the condition of the nation be, if he were also incapable of being set aside? It is therefore necessary that this power should be lodged somewhere, and yet the inheritance and regal dignity would be very precarious indeed, if this power were expressly and avowedly lodged in the hands of the subject only, to be exerted whenever prejudice, caprice, or discontent should happen to take the lead. Consequently, it can nowhere be so properly lodged as in the two houses of Parliament, by and with the consent of the reigning king, who, it is not to be supposed, will agree to anything improperly prejudicial to the rights of his own descendants. And therefore, in the king, lords, and commons, in Parliament assembled, our laws have expressly lodged it. 4. But, fourthly, however the crown may be limited or transferred, it still remains, it still retains its descendable quality, and becomes hereditary in the wearer of it. And hence, in our law, the king is sent never to die, in his political capacity, though, in common with other men, he is subject to mortality in his natural, because immediately upon the natural death of Henry, William, or Edward, the king survives in his successor, and the right of the crown vests, eo instanti, upon his heir, either the haris natus, if the course of descent remains unimpeached, or the haris factus, if the inheritance be under any particular settlement. So that there can be no interregnum, but, as Sir Matthew Hale observes, the right of sovereignty is fully invested in the successor, by the very descent of the crown. And, therefore, however acquired, it becomes in him absolutely hereditary, unless, by the rules of the limitation, it is otherwise ordered and determined. In the same manner as landed estates, to continue our former comparison, are by the law hereditary, or descendable to the heirs of the owner. But still, there exists a power, by which, the property of those lands may be transferred to another person. If this transfer be made simply and absolutely, 
the lands will be hereditary in the new owner, and descend to his heirs at law. But if the transfer be clogged with any limitations, conditions, or entails, the lands must descend in that channel, so limited and prescribed, and no other. In these four points consists, as I take it, the constitutional notion of hereditary right to the throne, which will be still further elucidated, and made clear beyond all dispute, from a short historical view of the successions to the crown of England, the doctrines of our ancient lawyers, and the several acts of Parliament that have from time to time been made, to create, to declare, to confirm, to limit, or to bar, their hereditary title to the throne. And in the pursuit of this inquiry we shall find that from the days of Egbert, the first sole monarch of this kingdom, even to the present, the four cardinal maxims above mentioned have ever been held the constitutional canons of succession. It is true this succession, through fraud or force, or sometimes through necessity, when in hostile times the crown descended on a minor or the like, has been very frequently suspended, but has always at last returned back into the old hereditary channel, though sometimes a very considerable period has intervened. And even in those instances where the succession has been violated, the crown has ever been looked upon as hereditary in the wearer of it, of which the usurpers themselves were so sensible that they for the most part endeavoured to vamp up some feeble show of a title by descent, in order to amuse the people, while they gained the possession of the kingdom. And, when possession was once gained, they considered it as the purchase or acquisition of a new estate of inheritance, and transmitted, or endeavoured to transmit it, to their own posterity, by a kind of hereditary right of usurpation. King Egbert, about the year 800, found himself in possession of the throne of the West Saxons, by a long and undisturbed descent from his ancestors of above three hundred years. How his ancestors acquired their title, whether by force, by fraud, by contract, or by election, it matters not much to inquire, and is indeed a point of such high antiquity as must render all inquiries at best but plausible guesses. His right must be supposed indisputably good, because we know no better. The other kingdoms of the Heptarchy he acquired, some by consent, but most by a voluntary submission. And it is an established maxim in civil policy, and the law of nations, that when one country is united to another in such a manner, as that one keeps its government and states, and the other loses them, the latter entirely assimilates or is melted down in the former, and must adopt its laws and customs. And in pursuance of this maxim, there hath ever been, since the union of the Heptarchy in King Egbert, a general acquiescence under the hereditary monarchy of the West Saxons through all the United Kingdoms. From Egbert to the death of Edmund Ironside, a period of above two hundred years, the crown descended regularly through a succession of fifteen princes, without any deviation or interruption, save only that King Edred, the uncle of Edwy, mounted the throne for about nine years, in the right of his nephew a minor, the times being very troublesome and dangerous. But this was with a view to preserve, and not to destroy, the succession, and accordingly Edwy succeeded him. King Edmund Ironside was obliged, by the hostile eruption of the Danes, at first to divide his kingdom with Canute, king of Denmark, and Canute, after his death, seized the whole of it, Edmund's sons being driven into foreign countries. Here the succession was suspended by actual force, and a new family introduced upon the throne, in whom, however, 
this new acquired throne continued hereditary for three reigns. When, upon the death of Hardinute, the ancient Saxon line was restored in the person of Edward the Confessor. He was not indeed the true heir to the crown, being the younger brother of King Edmund Ironside, who had a son Edward, surnamed, from his exile, the outlaw, still living. But this son was then in Hungary, and, the English having just shaken up the Danish yoke, it was necessary that somebody on the spot should mount the throne, and the confessor was the next of the royal line then in England. On his decease without issue, Harold the second usurped the throne, and almost at the same instant came on the Norman invasion, the right to the crown being all the time in Edgar, surnamed Atheling, which signifies in the Saxon language the first of the blood royal, who was the son of Edward the outlaw, and grandson of Edmund Ironside, or, as Matthew Paris well expresses the sense of our old constitution, quote, Edmundus autem latus fereum, rex naturalis de stirpe regum, genuit Edwardum, et Edwardus genuit Edgarum, cui de jure debebatur regnum anglorum. End, quote. End of section twenty.